Okay, uh, we are recording. Welcome. My name is Dave Myers. I'm with the Anne Arundel County Extension Office in, in agriculture and work with the agriculture of Eric community here in Southern Maryland. And uh, tonight we're going to, to uh, uh, do the nutrient management voucher training, required uh, two hour training for your recertification every three years. And so anyway, glad to have you on, on board here. And uh, we'll look at the kind of technical sciences and of kind of optimizing and applying nutrients for optimizing yields. So that's kind of be, going to be our discussion topic uh, uh, tonight. And uh, again, we are recording. I think you have to uh, allow the recording too, so make sure you do that. All right, let me make check on everything. I think we're all ready to go. First thing of order with this uh, process is this verification course verification form that I uh, worked with the Maryland Department of Agriculture member extension. Uh, you know, it works as part of the University of Maryland, so I'm a faculty member for the University of Maryland. And um, we do a lot of the teaching and training um, for these certification programs, both the pesticide and the nutrient management program. And uh, online uh, course verification is a form that I'm going to submit after you fill it out. After we finish what our course here tonight, you'll you'll get that to me, email it to me, or however you want to get it to me. And uh, then um, I'll sign off on it, send it over to Maryland Department of Agriculture. They're the regulatory agency. And so once they get the form, then it shows that you met the requirements for the two hours of training. Uh, then you can go ahead and uh, uh, have your voucher renewed. That'll be done through the department. So I do the education and Maryland Department does all the reg regulations and keeping up with those certificates for you. So let's go ahead. So as we go through tonight, make sure you put your voucher number there. If it's the first time, just put new. So if you've never had a voucher, uh, but if you've had a voucher, try to dig up your voucher number, put it there. If you don't have your voucher number, I would say... Um, uh, you can leave a blank, um, but it, that might not be the best to benefit. You might want to call the department, Maryland Department of Agriculture, and find out what your voucher number is to complete that if you don't have it. Print your name clearly, your full name, because there's a lot of people have the same name. Be surprised. Address, phone number, and then you sign it on line six there. And then part five, uh, we'll have uh, some course words, uh, uh, kind of a, um, through each about every 30 minutes, I'll offer up some words that are kind of a verification that you pay attention. And that, that'll be required that you put in whatever phrases or words we put in there as we go along tonight. I'll sign off of it when I get it, send it to Maryland Department of Agriculture, and then you'll be able to be certified again for three years. Everyone got that straight? Give me a check mark if that's all good to you or an X if you have a question or anything. And certainly, uh, or anything you want to share in chat too, I'll be keeping an eye on that. All righty. And I see that uh, Walter's coming over tomorrow to pick up his nutrient management plan. That's we got a new nutrient management advisor just started yesterday in Anne Arundel County. So you'll meet uh, our new advisor, uh, uh, Maxine. Um, oh gosh, what I think of the name Maxine Yun Y O O N, uh, Maxine. Anyway, my, the goal I think of uh, when I think about using nutrients, we talked about pesticides the other night. But when we talk about nutrients, um, you know, I think yeah, every every penny spent, every dollar spent on the farm. Uh, all you know always comes back to hopefully making uh, more production, more profitable, uh, making you a better farmer, right? And so, I think that's the mission of University of Maryland Extension. Uh, we've been in the business more than 100 years now, and and extension offices in most counties across the whole country. And uh, I think the goal of extension is to make every farmer a better farmer. And I think a lot of ways we've helped. And uh, and I know I, I can go back uh, about seven generations of grand great grandfathers in the farm in the Valley of Virginia before it was West Virginia. And um, I'm thinking about, uh, I know that every time, every generation, they got better. And so, and I can attest that I got better myself. So it's really an interesting thing uh, to watch uh, agriculture as it just continues to achieve new milestones of production. And, um, and it's good too, because we got a lot of people to feed. And at the same time, we have to do it sustainably, right? We have to learn how to uh, at least give back as much as we take to the earth to keep it as good as it is today for tomorrow. Um, I like to think that, that maybe we've done a little bit of degradation in some of maybe the last hundred or so years of some of our soils. And maybe now we have to kind of put back to those, build those soils up a little bit better. So maybe that generation still has the same hope we have. But we've we've been doing a good job at feeding people. We're feeding close to 8 billion. We just turned 8 billion here just recently. 8 billion people in the world. And I say, hey, we would have no problem with the souls that we have 
sustainably feeding 14 billion and maybe even 28 billion if we had to. So I'm not too concerned about population because agricultural science just continues to improve. So I'm still an optimist, at least when it comes from agriculture. We may have other issues, but from an agricultural standpoint, we can produce an amazing amount of food and we're continuing doing it. And we're doing it, I think, fairly sustainable as we go forward. So again, don't let uh, don't let all the doom, gloom, doom and gloom get you down. I don't have. I tell my students that we're we've done an amazing thing by feeding the people that we we have on the world, and we continue to feed them. In fact, we feed the population better now than in, than any time in the history of mankind. So uh, that's that's a testament, I think, to the productivity of agriculture. In 1804, we got our first billion. In 1927, took 123 years to reach our second billion. And then within 33 years of that, we reached in 1960 our third billion. And I think about that. I, you know, I was born in 61. There's less than half, well, less than half the people we have right now when I was born. So think about that. It's pretty sobering, isn't it? Um, the uh, four billion point was reached 14 years later, and we put on another billion in less than 15 years, all the way up till now. We're finally starting to see, um, I think, uh, the bell curve effect. We're finally starting to add more years uh, each billion that we put on. So I'm hoping that maybe that 14 billion might be a nice top, top of the bell curve and might be a good sustainable number that we can reasonably feed and still keep the environment uh, as happy as as we can. So it is amazing. And it's been all these agricultural advances, probably the number one advance. Uh, if you look at Malthus's predictions back in, um, he predicted right before that first billion was reached, and he predicted that um, there would be catastrophic, um, um, I guess you'd say starvation um, at 3 billion. He never believed that it could go past that. And the reason why we did was because um, of agricultural science and all the other sciences that go along with that uh, production, the industrial revolution. And so we were able then, and probably the biggest um, invention, the greatest invention, I think, was the Haber process, the ability to take N2 gas and create nitrate, which means we have fertilizer then from essentially an inert gas. Um, and so again, that was uh, probably the reason why we didn't all starve at uh, 3 billion. Uh, has a lot to do with it. Of course, a lot of other advances in science. I always say that science comes just in the nick of time. <laughs> so that's why I don't worry too much. And I'm hopeful that this gen ag is going to do the same thing. Um, it seems like we always manage to, just when it seems like um, we're at the precipice, uh, science comes just in the nick of time. And uh, and somehow we go to that next level uh, with uh, not much fanfare. But there's going to be this generation of agriculture that's really going to change, dynamically change, I think, um, you know, with the ag science that's going to go forward. Um, and we will feed the world. There's no doubt in my mind uh, that we will do it. I was in Rwanda. I took this picture. And uh, land of a thousand hills, a really pretty beautiful country, um, pretty close, just below the equator, just on the south side of the equator in Africa. And um, there's coffee, and they had cassava, and the grass. And uh, what amazed me is all that work on those hillsides, all that terraces were all done by hand. And all that farming is done by hand. The only mechanization is down in that valley. There's some mechanized um, farming going on down in these valleys. But most of that hilly country was done farmed by hand, 90% agrarian. Um, that means that any able-bodied person that wasn't too young or too old was out there with those hoes, tillage hoes, working and farming. And uh, I don't know that uh, U.S. citizens will ever do that again. <laughs> At least they won't. They will do it pretty reluctantly, I'll tell you that. Um, this system worked. Um, I was there actually to work with some colleagues and work with the Ministry of Agriculture in Rwanda because they were looking to export. They were so efficient um, with this backbreaking type of agriculture. Um, and, but there they are manuring, using those nutrients wisely. A um, lot of animals in that cycle, put the napier grass here on each one of these terrace edges to feed the cattle, sheep and goats and milk the goats and of course have meat. And, uh, and then all the other crops back in the back, there's some cassava, bananas. And uh, so, again, just beautiful to watch them work together collectively. And then there's a picture here. I happened to be there while they were building terraces, and I got to witness it myself. They said they built them by hand. I had a hard time believing it until I saw it. And the whole community comes out and with shovels and picks and 
And back work, they make these beautiful terraces and put the topsoil back on. Uh, and they understand that that fertility of that topsoil. And, and they try to make sure it doesn't wash away on those fairly steep terraces. But the terrace system works. And um, they've got a beautiful system that uh, holds things in place. They take clay, form these walls, and they cap it with um, uh, soil and put napier grass on it. And lo and behold, that napier grass grows and holds those terraces in place. And they can put all kinds of crops on those benches. And there's bananas and cabbage. And they had uh, a pineapple. So you can think of all the crops they can grow. We can't grow uh, right there in that kind of tropical reach. We had um, a summary of the first annual mushroom grower symposium. So I just want to share some things with you that's going on with our farming community here in, uh, in Maryland. And uh, we had our first annual mushroom grower symposium. Didn't know what to think when my colleagues and I worked with my colleagues, Neith Little and uh, Dave Clement, Clement Clements, Dave's a pathologist and uh, Neith is an urban ag educator in Baltimore City. And we thought, hey, you know, there's a lot of people calling about mushrooms and seems to be a lot of interest in it. Why don't we do something about it? You know, um, we certainly have Pennsylvania, which is a great mushroom production region. Let's go ahead and hold a symposium and see what happens. I would never believe that we've got about 35, 40 mushroom growers in Maryland that would actually come out to this event. And uh, we brought down John Petchy from Penn State, and he shared with some pretty interesting um, things going on with mushrooms, especially specialty mushrooms. Um, of course, these are the agaricus mushroom, mushrooms, the bread and butter. Um, and then, but he, he, I realized that he had this research center up Penn State. Never heard of it before, but Joe's. Um, um, uh, Dr. Pesci said, hey, we, you know, you need to come up here. We got a mushroom research center and we really devote most of our time now um, to especially mushrooms. And uh, so they have, of course, growing mushrooms means you have to have a sterile soil environment, inoculate it with the right spawn and get the right mushrooms growing. A lot to it, like anything in agriculture, is highly technical and has to be done right. Uh, and, uh, and so there are diseases and insect problems. And so there's like any other agriculture, it's got its, uh, its problems. Here's the agaricus. Um, this, of course, this is our our small button mushroom and the baby bellas and portabellas. If you let them go bigger, same species that we typically think of when we think of all the mushrooms we tend to eat and, and things. But there's some really interesting um, types out there that are kind of really special. Here's one lion's mane. Lion's mane actually is native here in North America. It grows in our area. Um, you find it in the fall if you know what you're looking for. Um, and of course, a lot of these mushrooms are reported to have all kinds of medical benefits. And so that's why there's a lot of interest, I think, in these mushrooms. Uh, and they're an interesting uh, um, uh, source of um, uh, different essential amino acids and proteins and things. So very interesting. Um, and of course, when you really think about it, mushrooms are kind of, they kind of grow like a plant, but they're more like a meat. You know, the actual flesh or material is more like a meat. So they're very interesting that way. Uh, kind of meat-like. There are a lot of times a meat substitute in a lot of dishes because they have the texture of meat, but yet they're a plant in, in, in the way that they grow. grow. So a very interesting uh, group of organisms. And a lion's mane will flush on um, 37 to 46 days. You get a crop cycle. A lot of times you're using these uh, formula bags where you, you put in the substrates by a certain recipe and then you inoculate. There's also the totem method where you take fresh cut logs. The important thing is they have to be fresh cut. Uh, no, no one typically likes to cut down a fresh tree, a young tree or a tree that's growing, but these, that's a good thing if you're growing mushrooms. If you have a beech tree or something that's not in the right place, that might be a real good candidate then to make a totem uh, for, uh, for mushrooms. They have to be fresh cut. You don't want to have any other fungi present in them, so you really need a kind of a disease-free log to start with. And they uh, cut them in these sections, usually beech, oak, sugar maple are some of the best. Of course, oak. Uh, uh, we have all these species right here, and uh, you tend to cover them with a paper bag. So it's kind of interesting. So you stack the logs, fresh cut logs. You put the uh, mixture of the spore uh, for the whatever mushroom you're trying to grow. In this case, he's stacking lion's mane um, in a totem. And then they cover them with a bag, keep them in a moist area, maybe put sprinklers on them occasionally if it gets too dry. And uh, and eventually, lo and behold, out comes the, uh, the cycle of mushroom. It takes a long period of time, though, for these outdoor log cultures. But there, there's the spawn mixture with the sawdust and the substrate that you put between each log, and they just stack them. And then you cover them and uh, wait for that flush of mushrooms. Um, in order to bring that flush of mushrooms, what you would do then would be um, you would look for the mycelium development in the total of the log, and then you would go ahead and shock it with a lot of water. So you would be irrigating for the sprinkle irrigation until eventually 
they would go ahead and start at that point to flush. There's other interesting mushrooms. Here's a wine cap, a mushroom, and it's um, native again to the eastern U.S. It gets its name because it has a reddish wine cap, uh, colored cap to it. And um, they actually can be cultivated in the garden. And they got some really interesting ways of doing that in the garden. They also can be put in bags. And here's a wine cap, uh, King Strafaria. And again, at uh, four to eight weeks, uh, right, the right temperature, typically the right humidity, the, the right substrate, and really good um, uh, uh, control. And you can actually produce a real nice, high quality um, product. New York um, has a really great Cornell, has a really great mushroom, especially mushroom program, too. And of course, Pennsylvania is the basically the producer, the big, largest producer of mushrooms as far as uh, the common um, button type portobellos, um, uh, mainly in the eastern region of Pennsylvania. They grow about 80% of the mushrooms in the, for the country there in Pennsylvania. But these specialty mushrooms, this is what happened to be um, what was done in a program right up in Queens in, in, um, in New York, um, and actually called the Mushroom Queens and kind of a neat. Uh, uh, play on words there and really some amazing production in some of these indoor units typically they're done in warehouses that are very climate controlled the wine caps here's an example of the wine caps being used um, outdoors uh, where they actually put a cardboard layer down and then wood chips then the spawn and sa sawdust substrate and then another layer of wood wood chips another layer of the sa sawdust and spawn um, substrate and then they top it with straw and they can put that it makes really good weed control in and around uh, um, some of these um, kind of urban gardens or maybe um, I would say you know kind of a maybe urban farming uh, would work really well and uh, and so here's an example of strafaria the red wine caps grown also very good weed control for the garlic and so they kind of work out works out pretty well together garlic's down into the soil reach and uh, and you end up growing the mushrooms on that la layered effect. Of... So again, great way to co combine, if you will, maybe some mushroom production with some of your garden and urban farming, farm production. Here's those wine caps um, being harvested. Oyster mushrooms, also very common, um, being used now, a lot of different um, um, uh, restaurants, really, very, uh, great, a very great delicacy. Um, typically found um, uh, on dead hardwoods is where you'd find them naturally. Um, and of course, you can put, uh, again, substrate mixtures to grow these oyster mushrooms. And they have a number of different types. Uh, of course, again, commercial produ production of all these different types requires pasteurized, sterilized substrate. Usually there's a recipe uh, for that substrate. And 65% moisture is kind of the typical goal for mushroom production. And you got to maintain that moisture at 65% during the entirety of the time. And then you typically need the spawning rate uh, based upon the weight of uh, the product, the, the spawn mixture. So here's our oyster mushrooms, day 19, day 20, day 21, and there's day 22. You can see some really beautiful trumpet moist, uh, oyster mushrooms. And you can get five to six pounds per 19 pound bag, and you can get three over three harvest. Uh, so again, you harvest once, and you get less harvest the second and third time. So pretty, pretty uh, a nice way to uh, make a little bit of income, I think. Here's the king trumpet, much or the royal trumpet, and bag production. And of course, shiitakes are done uh, both indoor and outdoor. Uh, most of the um, shiitakes that are typically uh, kind of um, uh, hit in the supermarkets are probably done by indoor cultivation, but a lot of the specialty farmers markets are growing the ones that are on log culture. The, um, and if you're interested in shiitake, uh, both Cornell and Penn State have a really good shiitake manual on just growing shiitake. And here's shiitake on log versus synthetic, so natural log versus synthetic log. And larger commercial is probably on the synthetic logs now and natural, more, more of the diversified farmer, I guess you say, smaller farmer. Here's shiitake inside versus the log outside. And uh, shiitake synthetic logs are, again, another kind of a, um, they're made by kind of a, a recipe, if you will. And uh, and then, of course, they're, um, here's Penn State shiitake formula that they really, really uh, prefer. Again, at about 60% moisture. And the synthetic log gives a very consistent, much higher production Shorter production time uh, can be as short as eight weeks for first flush, two to three weeks between flushes, and they continue to flush for a year or so. 
So again, they are uh, pretty prolific. The um, natural log um, takes three to four years, where they produce over three to four years. It takes about 12 to 15 months to get the first flush. So it's a much slower process. But people say that um, they actually are, are uh, taste better. So there are people that say that the log, natural log mushrooms are better you know, in taste and quality. And they, get, they demand a premium in price. The, um, they do have problems with insects, pests. Bugs, beetles. So again, it's not everything is like any type of agriculture, right? There's probably something that's always going to try to ruin it for you. But they, um, shiitake natural law, better quality, better taste, higher value, uh, but and less capital investment. Uh, this with this out, but it's still a lot of labor and a lot of work. Again, you have to have fresh cut logs. Might want to file a tree service around to get your logs. The Cornell rates the logs as from excellent to not suitable. So again. In the excellent to good category, we have plenty of species there that you can grow shiitake on. And uh, of course, oak and sugar maple be in the preferred and beech being down there as good. Uh, you inoculate by actually, they typically use drills and plugs of, of inoculant. And so they do this plug spawn, uh, easy and cheap way to do it. And um, once you inoculate and you can buy all these different spawn methods, uh, to do your natural logs online, got good reputable sources. Penn State has really good um, sources for that. Then you have to stack the logs um, and you wait, you watch them um, just out in the environment. You might want to water them if they get a little too dry, not too much water at this stage. But what you're trying to do is get the mycelium from, the, from where you plugged it to you see mycelium at both ends of the logs. That means that that log has fully um, uh, been uh, basically... Uh, this, the um, fungi have fully uh, grown through that material, that cellulose uh, log material. So you look for the mycelium at the end of the log, and then you do a 24-hour soak. And then typically with one, of well, course, that causes a flush. And uh, usually then you, after flushings, after shockings, uh, about every seven to weeks, you do another shocking and you pick in about a week. So you're going to continue this for a number of years. It's not uncommon to go three or four years probably most likely two to three years of good production. So a lot about specialty mushrooms, right? So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'll just share that with you because I think it's just a neat topic. And uh, we're going to hope to put together a little bit more resources for Maryland uh, mushroom growers going into the future. It seems to be uh, wanting to grow, start a Maryland Mushroom Association. So that was kind of the goal of the meeting. So we're hoping to maybe spearhead that uh, in the coming years. The other thing that I was actually, I was actually out today drilling post uh, to put in the, um, we planted our vineyard last week. We planted um, some Barbera in the my urban farming research center now, right at the Anne Arundel County Extension office. So I just walk out the my office door and head across the field. And I got a little beautiful little couple acres now uh, as a demonstration teaching tool. And I call it the Anne Arundel Extension Urban Farm Research Center. And um, got a lot of things online there. So we've got our soil test and our nutrient management plans there. So you can see that follow the progress as we try to put up a lot of pictures about what we're doing out there. Hopefully get uh, a little more teaching and pruning different clinics up there to help people that get, want to get into some different things. So we got, we just planted our apple block last week and our peach block and our blackberries and our, our vineyard today. We were putting the post in the, in the app, in the vineyard and in the, on the blackberries. And I noticed that already the, uh, the peaches are leafing out. The apples are about to bud swell and uh, no sign yet from the, uh, the grapes. Um, and the, but the blackberries, we put them in as plants. So we're off to a good start, I think, on our small fruit and fruit, tree fruit production area. We're going to put in a little hops yard and we're going to put in some specialty corn for uh, uh, cornbreads and tortillas. And I'm going to put a little buckwheat in, just play around with that a little bit and probably some pumpkins for the kids to harvest. And I'm going to, in the high tunnel, I'm putting in a chili mix project. So we've got about 14 different chili peppers and some culinary herbs to put in there. So we're a lot, a lot going on in this little couple acres. There's where we started last year, April 30th. And uh, again, I uh, started, um, actually, I formed the Anne Arundel and Prince George's Urban Farming Work Group. And out of that, I kind of brainchilded the idea that we needed a research clinic and extension uh, um, uh, demonstration. So anyway, that's where we're at. And I uh, went pretty quick, found a little piece of land there close by and got right into it. The um, so May had the had that uh, old area bush hogged and then plowed and next thing you know we put the sign up and uh, and got a good vision of what we were going to do that first year and uh, by month of June I had planted golden millet 
foxtail, pumpkins, Indian corn, popcorn, sunflowers, um, all throughout the property. Of course, I, with my nutrient management plan, I made sure I went out there with some gypsum and uh, all my different, uh, some urea, didn't need too much potassium and phosphorus. It was pretty rich soil. And so off to a good start. There we are. Of course, put herbicides out there too, because I don't have time to hoe all that. But we did do a little hoe, and there's my in, ag intern. After we put a little sandia down, we were looking for some escapes. And there I am actually getting ready to spray some sandia, I think, out there on the pumpkins. And uh, that's what it did. See that little little activity there? Sure helps you out. Pumpkins looking fine, and the morning glory and the nut sedge is looking pretty poor. Didn't take much of a hoe then to take that out. And there we are getting things cleaned up into July. Pumpkins starting to fill in. Here's our millet by the end of July. Pumpkins in the background. Here's me in the standing in, in the sunflower rows between the corn and the pumpkin. So it was fun. Enjoyed it. And there we are getting closer to harvest in August. And really didn't do too much. Um, most urban farming and urban agriculture tends not to you. They tend to be organic. But I want to make sure that I don't limit myself in any way. So I want to make sure I can use fertilizer when I want to. I'm still a farmer, I guess. And I'm going to use fungicides to make sure I have a crop. And uh, we didn't have to use too much spray, but we did a little bit of IPM, made sure we went out there and tried to very strategically put a few fungicides out. Put the fertility out that we needed, uh, not anything extra, and uh, and uh, ended up with some nice crops. So we were pretty, uh, didn't really have to do any insecticide um, use the whole year. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but we put herbicides out and some fun fungicides. And we had a whole far ha fall harvest party. So again, uh, I'm going to say that I'm doing this by typical best science methods, right? And also the best integrated approach to pest management. That's kind of what I teach at Maryland. Uh, every semester, I teach a course in pesticide use and safety for my students. And so I'm kind of practicing what I preach there. And there we are putting the cover crop in, right? So cover crop in there after we got the pumpkins off October 28th. And there we are November 10th, putting up the high tone. So I got more, a lot more slides to add, but of course, here's a, what we plan to do. And we're already doing in 2023 and uh, culinary herbs. And there's our high tunnel. There's my drawing of what, what it's going to look like this year. You can kind of see a picture here of the, of the blackberries trellis along the back of the property, peach apple block vineyard. Hops down through the center there, uh, some corn, pumpkins, a couple of pumpkin plots, high tunnel, asparagus bed, and cut flowers. So again, a lot to do, but keep me busy. And my my colleagues and volunteers too. So we're having a lot of fun. You know, when I think about ag science, um, I really think genetic engineering has been um, an amazing, um, not just to the fact that we've controlled insects by putting BT in some crops, or that we've allowed them to basically use um, uh, a Roundup herbicide or a dicamba herbicide over top of our crops and not kill them, which we normally would. But what really amazes me is that I think we're going to genetically engineer crops to be better users of nutrients, to be less drought, uh, um, uh, more more drought tolerant, uh, very resistant to drought. Uh, so I think the things that we're going to do are really going to design our crops. Um, not just to control pests or make them so that we can put herbicides over top of them, but really design them so that uh, we're, from an environmental standpoint, uh, allows us to use nutrients a lot less um, and also to uh, still continue to increase yields. So it'd be much better. It'd be nice if we could get our, our crops to act more like weeds, right? <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's a goal. I think the future is, is that we'll have crop plants that'll be just as aggressive and probably have all the protection me mechanisms that some of the best ag aggressive weeds have out there. They always seem to get enough nutrients and, and, and do well. You know, it wasn't that long ago that um, I was sitting in uh, University of Maryland as an undergraduate, and uh, they were debating whether or not this gene gun was going to work. And, uh, and uh, you know, they really understood, they were really understood standing at that point that, yeah, hey, we, we can, we know that if we denature these um, these uh, uh, RNA and um, DNA, um, uh, you know, molecules, we can we can re 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 do recombination. They knew, they kind of understood that, and they actually first started out using radiation. So the first genetic, before we even really knew about the helix, before Watson and Crick even discovered or understood what DNA looked like, they knew they they had it there, and they knew they knew they impacted it with radiation. So. 
But the Jean gun was really interesting. It was turned out it was a Crossman air pistol is what they used. And it was a project of Monsanto with spearheading. And they almost gave up. Uh, everyone kind of scoffed. I remember sitting in the agronomy building and all the agronomists, the teachers, professors were scoffing that they thought this gene gun was just a, a hoax, a, a ludicrous idea. And lo and behold, just about the time they pulled, ready to pull the plug, they made it work. They, they uh, took uh, a callous tissue of soybeans and they took uh, uh, the denatured uh, DNA and, uh, and fragments of DNA and put it in little spheres of tungsten and shot them in like a shotgun. And lo and behold, uh, they were able to recombine some of the genetic material from the, uh, in this case, I think it was a petunia that was resistant to Roundup to uh, soybean. It shouldn't surprise us because viruses and bacteria do it all the time. So it's not something we invented. Uh, we just uh, learned how to start to do, learn how the tech, about the techniques. Agrobacterium is pretty amazing. And sweet potatoes, basically, when we start looking deeper in genomics of each crop plant, we find that there's a lot of shared uh, genes and gene swapping. So what we thought was not likely to occur actually occurs all the time. And that's the reason why sweet potatoes, agrobacterium is the reason why sweet potatoes have a tuber and a swollen uh, and DNA that's from agrobacterium that causes that. So very interesting science. And now we're getting even more the ability to do gene editing is really in, in, increasing. I never liked GMO. I never liked genetically modified. I like genetic engineering. I think that's a more precise term. So we really are at genome editing now and genetic engineering. And so these techniques are going to change the world and they're gonna make our crop plants even more productive going into the future. And not just resistant to herbicides or insecticides, but extremely productive. And we're starting to see that now in the, some of the genetic create traits that we're putting in. A lot of them, not just insect resistance and herbicide tolerance, but drought tolerance and other, other characteristics. We have an apple and a potato now that resist bruising and browning. And so a lot of different things are coming into play uh, again. And of course, you know, papaya was the first genetically modified crop and it was given for free to the world. So a lot of these advances are going to be given to the world for free. There's a genetically modified banana and coffee plant that will probably be saviors to the uh, some this disease called bacterial blight and banana and coffee rust um, will be basically not a problem because of genetic engineering. So again, pretty fascinating science. If you want to learn more about it, um, go to um, uh, USDA, go to the Economic Research Service, ERS, go to their website and look up genetic engineering, look up organic, look up a lot of things that they keep good tabs on and records of what's being done out there scientifically. And then you get some good answers for things, not just myths and, and people that people share in the public and really don't have any, any appreciation for what's going on in agriculture. Here's a genetically engineered crops. And we can see, I remember I was a decob dealer in 1996. And I remember going to the meetings in winter, fall, winter, fall of 95. Uh, before we were getting ready to market our beans and it went to a conference. Actually, it was up in Frederick, up at Dutch's Daughters. And all the decalb dealers came to there together from Maryland, Delaware. And uh, we had a meeting and we were debating. They were deciding how much of these new genetically modified Roundup Ready soybeans should we sell or should we hope that farmers would buy, essentially was the discussion. And uh, we all got about a 20% allotment that first year in 1996. And uh, we sold them. Pretty quick. Most people think, but most farmers felt that was a pretty good idea. We debated about the technology fee because it was half the price of the bag of beans. And we thought, well, they're never going to pay that. And, you know, they're going to say no. And, and uh, but then, you know, lo and behold, that Roundup Ready system was so good, farmers couldn't avoid it. They paid that technology fee. I never had one complain. And the next year, that's all they wanted. I had a hard time scrambling to get enough of them. So, really amazing that technology, how, how well. It played right into the production. And the same with the BT corns. I remember we had the corn borers and corn root worms and corn ear worms. And I just think about, you know, corn looked pretty tattered by the middle of the summer from army worm. And I think, wow, you don't even see that anymore. You see this spectacular corn. And it's because of that, we, we were sitting around. I remember when I was in master's school at University of Maryland in a master's program in agronomy. And we, we were talking about when we reached the glass ceiling. And it was the early 90s before we got into the first GMO. 
And I remember everyone's kind of lamenting that our yields were kind of plateauing and that we weren't going to keep up with the pop requirement going forward with our, our yields on corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, major crops. And uh, we were concerned. There was a lot of concern in the room about that, that what are we going to do to, to bring these yields? Well, we broke the glass ceiling again with these genetic uh, traits. And so, and the yields just keep going up. And it's pretty phenomenal. And so um, that's why I say, you know, hey, if we, if we, all, all we have to do is not waste food. And if we quit wasting food, we probably wouldn't have to worry about feeding even 14 billion going forward. We got the, we got the potential right now. Well, early on 2003, U.S. certainly led the way in acreage of genetically modified crops. Uh, but we had other players, Argentina, Canada, Brazil, mainly all the Americas, right? Canada and the, the North and South America. And then China, South Africa were, were coming into it pretty quickly, too. And, uh, and so where are we at now, you know? Well, the latest report I came out, came out in 2014, I'm waiting on some more recent data. But all trends are is that... Um, Biotech is growing fast, and it's growing fastest now in some of the underdeveloped countries. So places like Africa, where I was visiting, things like that. I thought, well, that's pretty fascinating. And U.S. is still a big player, but a lot of other players are catching up. And India is one that's really coming on strong here in the last uh, five or so years. So uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these crops are going around the world, um, and farmers are benefiting uh, from, the, from the not having to spray uh, and also very easy systems with the herbicide tolerance uh, system. So, so biotechs are on, on the move from 1996 to 2015. Um, we see um, uh, big changes in that red line there, which is the underdeveloped countries or the developing countries. And we're going to see, I think, a big sweep through uh, Africa here pretty soon, where they have typically one by one these these countries adopt uh, organic, uh, I mean, uh, biotech practices. And genetically engineered. Certainly Asia, China, Southeast Asia, down in down, Australia, even European countries now are starting to uh, soften on their on some of their long-standing prohibition to biotech, but now it's starting to really develop everywhere. There, as far as I know, there's no trade restrictions anymore on biotech crops. So again, it's uh, everyone's kind of accepted our corn and soybeans and, as the way they are. And again, they're pretty much predominantly uh, 98, 95% or better of all of our crops now that have uh, have been genetically engineered are typically the crops that we're choosing to grow now. This is a picture in Uganda. I was actually in Uganda. The, the lady in reds in, in her, in, and I, I knew if, as soon as I saw the crop, I knew exactly what it was. It's army worm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I hadn't seen it because of BT for quite some time. And I remember scouting for army worm all the time, ride my little motorcycle out through the corn and try to uh, make some measurements of whether or not I need to go out and make a rescue spray, right? And uh, I told this poor farmer here, she's going to have to backpack spray her cornfield, which is pretty substantial. And not only is she going to have to spray it once, but she's going to have to spray it through the season probably about a dozen times to, in order to protect this corn crop. They live on the equator. The army worm never stops breeding. So this was an invasive pest. This is the first time they ever had an army worm. It came in through Tanzania. This is on the other side of Lake Victoria in Africa. And Chuck, Chuck Schuster there, he's from Montgomery County, and I were working with this farmer and a colleague there in Uganda, an uh, extension fellow. And again, we're saying, hey, you know, we're not gonna, you're not going to solve this one by spraying your way out of it. Uh, the answer is genetically engineered corn, BT. And there's actually my daughter sitting next to me. She's a biologist, and she went with me on this project. And even that, those bananas in the background, if you can see them there, they got black stalks. That's bacterial wilt. And so we were talking about genetic and engineering and saying, you know, Cornell has developed a banana that will solve that problem. And we looked at some coffee and it had coffee rust and said, you know, they, we've, got a, uh, they, we've got a new coffee rust, genetically engineered coffee now that will solve that problem. You won't have to worry. And uh, certainly we're going to solve that. There happened to be a senator in there with this group of farmers that night from Kampala in Uganda. And they were getting ready to vote. And he, he pulled me aside and said, you're coming to my house for dinner. And uh, we're going to we'd love to have a little bit more deeper conversation because we're going to vote on whether or not Uganda accepts genetically engineered crops. And he said, you convinced me that uh, that maybe it's the answer, the solution. We also went into Mosaka, Uganda, and I was amazed to go inside this little trading store and see all the different chemistries and everything bottled there from around the world, China, Pakistan, India, all different places you could buy these products coming from. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty impressive. And to think about Monsanto and, and some of the things that it's doing with RNA and, um, 
the idea that you know what makes what makes in this case glyphosate work. So uh, Monsanto, before it sold to Bayer, had a corporation called BioDirect, and BioDirect was looking at how they could interfere um, and essentially turn off the mechanism for resistance for weeds. That was the kind of the goal. Essentially, you could turn off the mechanism for soybeans and essentially do the same thing, kill the soybean. Um, but what is that mechanism? What is it that glyphosate does to a plant that keeps it from uh, you know, continuing to grow? And why is it specific only to plants? It doesn't affect animals or any other fungi or any other species, insects, or what have you. It's because of this enzyme, EPSPSP, or EPSPS enzyme. It's actually a very essential protein um, that is needed in photosynthesis. And so typically a plant, messenger RNA, DNA helix splits, messenger RNA comes off during transcription, goes through a ribosome, and then out comes the protein, right? That's how we everything gets made and everything in, in us gets made. And so uh, these segments of DNA, the messenger RNA then feeds through the protein factory, the ribosome, and out comes the protein. Pretty amazing, really. And um, and if our most plants have a certain amount of this EPSB enzyme, essentially enough to make sure that photosynthesis carries on, right? Well, what happens when Roundup comes along is Roundup binds with EPSPS enzyme and makes it inoperable. And in this case, then uh, the plant, if there's too, if there's enough glyphosate to bind all the enzyme, then the plant then is subject to not making any more, having any more photosynthesis occur. And the binding can go on for such a length of time that uh, uh, the plant will never photosynthesize again. Essentially, essentially it's going to die. And that's why it's that slow, stop growing, turn yellow, turn brown, and go on, right? So it's, and it's systemic too, so it goes throughout the entire plant. So glyphosate's very amazing in that way. Uh, how it operates in the plant. Also very low toxicity, very, very specific to this enzymatic process. So again, very good reason why we have a lot of faith in the safety of glyphosate. Glyphosate then in a plant, uh, essentially the plant uh, that we designed our, our, uh, our soybeans to be is they, and the weeds eventually we select for with selection pressure so that they have so much messenger RNA feeding through the ribosome for this enzyme that they have so much of the enzyme that no matter how much glyphosate we put in the plant, essentially there's enough enzyme to still carry on photosynthesis. And so it's this overproduction of this enzyme then that gives the resistance. So lo and behold, BioDirect comes along and says, what happens if we could put RNA interference with the glyphosate and bind this RNA before it goes through the ribosome, we could essentially halt the production of the enzyme. And it works. It really works. You can actually turn off the mechanism by binding with the messenger RNA with enough of the RNA interference and essentially stop that overproduction, eventually have the plant that's subject to being killed again. So we can turn off the resistance mechanism. We can even turn off the soybean uh, mechanism so that it also would die too. So a very interesting uh, way of approaching it. So again, it's this genetic engineering that's really going to be the answer, I think, as we go forward, all these different systems that we're learning how to use. Here's dicamba tolerant soybeans. I remember this is the first picture that Ron Ritter took over at the Y Research Educates and he shared it with us. And essentially he was really amazed at how the, he could keep putting this dicamba on these beans, two, three, four, five X rates, and they would still basically be, you know, looking fine. And so how in the world is that even possible? What are they, you know, that's when it always amazes me. Okay, I need to know how that works. You know, that's kind of what first thing comes to my mind is, okay, I know dicamba normally kills soybeans. What do they do to these soybeans to make it so dicamba doesn't kill them? And so it really was pretty interesting, pretty interesting um, piece of research here. It works this way. Um, Dr. Donald Weeks in Lincoln, Nebraska, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and his team of researchers were licensed by Monsanto to come up with a way to confer um, uh, the ability to, to metabolize dicamba within the plant tissue of a soybean. So how are they going to do that? Well, they knew that dicamba, which is a benzoic acid, a natural plant hormone, so all plants have a certain amount of benzoic acids, that there are soil bacteria uh, called Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas multifilia, which actually feeds on the benzoic acid. So if you put banvoil out on a field, a pasture, let's say, uh, to control broadleaf weeds, there's a whole host of soil bacterium that are sitting there waiting for that benzoic acid because they're going to eat it. So think about it. Every, all these chemicals that we use are is organic chemistry, which means it contains carbon and a lot of other consistent uh, constituents um, that typically can are recycled right back into biological activity, right? 
And so, it, I mean, that's why it's called biochemistry. And that's why we use biochemical approaches when we do all the different control mechanisms that we use. Uh, there, you know, so it really is fascinating to me. In this case, they knew that the Pseudomonas had a way to metabolize the, the benzoic acid to break it down essentially so they could be broken down and essentially consume the, the carbon and different things could be useful to the to the, the bacteria so they basically found that genetic pathway extracted those genes that produced that um, the, uh, that metabolic prep process and put them in a soybean and lo and behold soybeans now will break down benzoic acids in this case dicamba as soon as it goes into the plant and essentially it's not, not harmful to the cramp it makes it inactive inactive and so in this case, by metabolically breaking it down, cleaving the molecule, which would normally kill, be a death blow to soybeans. Now, all of a sudden, soybeans don't care how much benzoic acid you put on. And they came out with extended max beans, and they, came, and they found out the same thing worked for uh, 2,4-D, which is a phenoxy, also a plant growth hormone. And they found out that they could do the same thing, and they made duo and list beans so that we can put 2,4-D and dicamba. And we have essentially a, a metabolic pathway built into the plant to break those down so they do no harm. Fascinating, right? And I mean, it really is fascinating science. A couple of things as we think about nutrients is that I always like to think that the homeowners now have to be pay attention to nutrients too. And now that, um, um, you know, they, they come under a lot of scrutiny. Of course, all the lawn care companies have to follow fertilizer application based on soil test. And everyone has to stop applying fertilizer uh, in November 15th. And so, and they can resume again until March 1st. So again, these are good, these are good rules to keep our bay. Um, hopefully keep fertilizer, a lot of the nutrients out. We know nutrients are leaky and the, our, all our best efforts, we're still going to have, it's a, it's a biological system, right? And we can't control when it rains six inches. Well, we can do our best to split and apply those products when the plant really needs them. And hopefully we can limit the amount of nutrients that leave our soils and either by leaching or runoff. And hopefully with good um, cover cropping techniques, we can capture those nutrients and keep them in the field for, for agriculture. I think all this science really is amazing. This is another picture I took in Uganda. Again, uh, it's that on that Serengeti reach, it comes down around Lake Victoria, kind of like West Texas on the equator. It's pretty amazing cattle country. Of course, all the great game animals run down through that corridor too. And there we are, Abby and Chuck and I we had to stop as the Ugandan cattle kind of blocked the road for a while. What's really interesting is all those little white dots in the background are actually the uh, butterfly of the uh, um, of the, the the invasive species. No, not we're not only the recipients of invasives. That was the first time you would have seen an army worm flying around like that uh, in uh, in that area. We were working with the students there, uh, part of the project, and that's called that's a well. They in Africa they call it a borehole, and so they were actually getting fresh water from the borehole. Very nice uh, drilled well. Real high quality water. I drank right out of that with not a, not a worry a bit. Um, excellent uh, water out of that uh, well there. And um, here they are taking those containers. And Chuck just finished plumbing uh, a little trickle irrigation project. So we brought some tape. I actually bought, purchased that tank, tank back in Masaka, that little store I showed you. Uh, right around the corner from there, we purchased that tank, put it on top of the Jeep lightweight poly tank and we plumbed that uh till we could run a trickle tape there's abby and all everyone's pretty proud of that picture there we got our trickle irrigation system coming into action and uh, here's chuck explaining how you can uh you know filter uh the water and uh run good clean water down through this trickle tape uh all you need is about eight psi to operate so we only need that tank up on a little bit of elevation to get that and all they had to do is fill up that tank and the, the trickle would come down I taught them how to make nice straight rows. They typically didn't do a very good job at that. So I said, we're going to buy some twine and some sticks. And we're going to make sure we put these rows straight. And it's going to, and we're going to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a my, way my grandfathers would do things, right? And so we got out there and everyone got engaged. And every time I, I looked up, there were more farmers. <laughs> so it was amazing to see uh, how quickly, of course, we stopped and got some plants on en route. This is tomatoes. We picked up some tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. And here we are um, putting the little mounds there to put the plants in. Instead of a continuous raised bed, we just kind of did mound raised beds. Nice straight line. And then we put the trickle tapes right down along there, set the plants. Taught them about wood ash. You know, we, they typically, we did a, some lime, we did some pH testing. The pH was low. 
And I said, well, you know, you can't, you don't have enough wood ash to do the entire field, but let's make sure at least around the plant, we get the pH right. So we, we kind of uh, sit down, calculated how much lime we needed to apply. You know that wood ash, if you look down here at the bottom where it says calcium carbonate equivalents, wood ash is about 43% where a good ground agricultural limestone would be 100% calcium carbonate. So um, even our best limestone is typically not 100%. It's usually right around 89, 90%. So wood ash is about half of our typical ag limestones. And so coming out of our area here in Maryland. And so wood ash is a very good uh, additive for adjusting pH. It has a very high pH to start with. And again, it's by weight, it's 43% as effective as our, uh, as 100% calcium carbonate. And at least half of what we typically put on the field. And wood ash also comes with a whole lot of other things that limestone doesn't come with. So we see the calcium ratio there, wood ash and limestone. Potassium, look at the potassium that we get with wood ash. We're also getting magnesium. We're getting iron, phosphorus even. Very little phosphorus in limestone. You wouldn't expect to see any, but a pretty good amount really in, in uh, phosphorus and wood ash. Manganese. And of course, you got boron, high. And you come get a few other things you typically don't want, like arsenic cadmium, chromium, but they're all well below uh, thresholds of, uh, that would be of concern. Uh, you have to put a lot of wood ash on to be concerned with this amount of lead or chromium or, ca or cadmium. But uh, you also get zinc. And so a lot of the things that we think of as essential, copper, um, we're, we're seeing quite a bit of that in wood ash. And so again, we, we get quite a bit of benefit from wood ash besides just the ability to reduce pH. The, um, and then we can start to look at the crops, right? And we can start to look across the different crops and what the target pH is, right? So that's kind of fun to always kind of know. You know, if we're planting potatoes, we might not want to add wood ash, right? We might be satisfied with that 5.5, five, 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 5.4, or even 5.2. And then, um, you know, so then, of course, based on the soil, then we can start to kind of estimate how much wood ash or limestone it would take uh, to affect a pH change, right? Um, to get from a target um, initial pH to a target pH of 6.5. And so that's what they typically do when they give you those, um, you know, uh, recommendations in your nutrient management plan, right? They're making those calculations for you. So not only did we have wood ash, but we had some manures. Of course, we had green manures. We had manures from animals. We had wood ash. We also had, um, I bought them some diammonium phosphate, <laughs> some DAP, because they were going to be especially... Um, low on nitrogen. And in this soil, they're typically low on phosphorus. They need more phosphorus. And so I bought them some DAP, diammonium phosphate. And we can balance the equation pretty well with just those materials. And there's that trickle tape. Didn't take long before everyone could see, hey, that's a, that really works. You know, that little irrigation system we set up um, is going to produ produce a nice amount of tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers for that little school cafeteria. And not only that is uh, they don't have to go out and water each plant around each plant like they normally would. They got just dump it in that tank up above there. Eventually, I told them to get a little solar pump, put in your bore well, and it just you can have a little solar pump trickle that, keeping that tank full for you. No one has to keep dumping those. Um, so again, that was kind of part of what we were talking about. Nutrient management. Uh, again, anyone interested in nutrient management probably ought to take this handbook out every every now and then i actually have it on my website so if you really want to see the nutrient management handbook go to my website and uh we'll uh we'll go ahead and and uh the um and you'll find that pdf and you'll actually have a copy of that that you can kind of browse through i think everyone should review that every now and then i've talked too long i forgot about our course words here so it's time for a couple of our our secret words. We're almost halfway through, so we'll go ahead and put two of them now, right now. So, what did we talk about? Let's see. We talked about um, um, uh, biotech and uh, feeding the world. So, let's go ahead and make our. our I'm going to type them in here. Our first set of, of course, world is. Um, um, I guess. How about um, uh, feeding feeding the world? Uh, how about just um, the world. I think that's something that we can, we have no problem doing. Feeding the world. That's our, let me go ahead and hit enter. That's our first set of words. So let's put that, I'm going to write, make sure I write that down myself so I'll remember here. Um, our first group of words is feeding the world. And uh, give me a check mark if you got that and you're still awake. <laughs> yeah. We're almost halfway done. This is good. 
feeding the world. I think we can do it. I'm not a, I'm not a bit convinced that we won't. And I'm not too concerned. So feeding the world. That's going to be our first our first. And then I think our second word, because we are into the second half here, um, I think we should it should be uh, biotech. Biotech. I think uh, biotech is going to offer us a lot more than just pest management. Um, I think it's really going to design our plants um, to do much more than that. So biotech. All right, give me a check mark. You guys got them? Feeding the world and biotech. Yeah, I think that's I think that's too good. Feeding the world, that's feeding 14 billion. We're only we're not, we're a little over halfway. I don't think we have a problem with it. All right. There are two first two course words to put on that one and two blank on your verification form. Feeding the world and biotech. You know, fertilizer. Uh, nutrients come in a lot of different forms, right? You know, we use biosolids, legumes, manure, commercial fertilizers. You know, I wrote a little ramble here in my newsletter. I, I tend to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's always never ceases to amaze me. We always talk about, oh, we can use all these organic materials. The trouble is we don't have enough. You realize that? That we wouldn't even come close to the amount of organic material uh, in manures or biosolids to make even a dent upon the amount of fertilizer that has to go out there on our crop fields. I can remember that even in a dairy farm with 450 cows, we still only had enough manure to, act, to actually do each field once every five years. And that's not, <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't sustain production with that at that, that rate. So we really typically, and I, you find that really true when fertilizer prices go up, all of a sudden <laughs> you really find how scarce uh, manures and biosolids and things like and ch chicken litter and all that really become because people recognize the value of those things. And um, so again, that's not even an option. Really, the option that we have is to grow plants. That's the only way we're ever going to have enough um, biological activity in the soil as well as organic matter. And so it really is all about probably legume production, fertilizers, manures. It's using all of them, essentially. That And residues, crop residues, all these things are very important. And the really, really, we have to balance the equation. That's why I think cover crops are so important because we really can't balance that equation if we don't have cover crops out there. So cover crops become as important to soil building as the cash crop. And I think a lot of us are coming to that recognition, the realization now. And we have to do soil testing, right? Our basic soil test, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Of course, calcium and magnesium is our liming recommendations. That's typically what our soil test. We probably also ought to focus on those other mineral um, um, elements that are uh, we can add typically the micronutrients are very important right we typically don't test for nitrogen because we always know it typically will be, will be limited and we can kind of estimate what that nitrogen needs going to be based upon crop crop growth and that nitrogen cycling hopefully it's cycling in the cover crop and be available um and we do uh, do give allowances for that i think that's why cover crops are so important is because we do cycle more nutrients and we can reduce a lot of times the amount of nutrients that we use if we can kind of get an estimate of that. It's a fertilizer bag. It has a guarantee, right? The 5, 10, 15. That tells us something, right? 5% nitrogen, 10% phosphate, uh, P205, and 15% and, uh, potash, K2O. And so, again, that um, that's pretty important. And uh, we get a guarantee because the state chemists test every bag, right? So not every bag, but they certainly test enough of it coming in. And every now and then they catch people cheating, right? So that's one good thing that we have going for us, right? Maryland Department of Agriculture State Chemist is checking on these things for us and making sure these analyses are true. Don't all, don't the rest of the world doesn't have that luxury. Here's a picture I uh, was taken in Anne Arundel County, my home county. And what is that person doing? And uh, actually, this is the son of the extension agent in 1929, Henry Day. That's his son. I don't know his name. Henry didn't put it in the in his report, but he's got a couple mules. And what's he doing? Anyone know what he's doing? And there in the background, you see a couple more mules and you see a, a, a planter, transplanter, right? With the water tank in the front of it. And they're getting ready to plant something and they are planting something. And they're going right down alongside of these fertilizer rows. Um, that's what they're piece putting banded fertilizer, right? So actually this was a fertilizer trial in 1929 in Anne Arundel County for sweet potatoes. 
And I thought, well, this is really amazing. So they had a 1X, 2X, and 3X rate of fertilizer as a demonstration for sweet potato production. Now, I guess the answer is we can certainly see that there was a really nice yield increase from 1X to 2X. And maybe there's a pretty good bump here from 2X to 3X, but maybe it's not enough to be economical, right? Or maybe the real, the rate, maybe the two and a half X is might be the rate that really is the most economical, right? So, or maybe we could have done a, even a further, a 4X rate and see, see known for sure that we were essentially ret, ret at the optimum, right? Uh, for fertilizer to return. We don't want to put more fertilizer than we need, but we certainly don't want to come up short, right? And so I think that's the vital um, information that we need when it comes to nutrient management. And sometimes we forget the simplest things like liming. You know, lime, liming and typically, maybe not so much up in Frederick for you guys, especially if you're on the other side of Frederick in that Hagerstown Valley, where you have natural limestone soils. But even those soils get an acid roof and they still need a little bit of lime on top. But down here in Southern Maryland, if we don't lime every three years, uh, we're probably going on a downward trend on pH. And so about a, usually I find out in Southern Maryland, coastal plain soils, about a ton of lime every three years kind of keeps you where you're at. And so again, we don't want to neglect it because it also, it's it's at, uh, it really is interesting. You know, the first, uh, probably one of my, my great grandfather's peers here, Edmund Rufin in the Valley of Virginia, uh, Edmund Rufin was a Virginia farmer and agronomist, and he was the one, first one to start to understand liming and pH, and he wrote, a, wrote his uh, book on it, essentially about soil acidity and the importance of liming. I thought that was kind of interesting, uh, and again, that looks like a contemporary to my seventh-time great-grandfather, <laughs> and um, I'm thinking that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot, right, uh, about agriculture, and even as early as, as in that era of there, uh, the early 1800s. We really were under, trying to understand these things. But we understand that pH is so critical because a pH affects the availability of plant nutrients. And of course, calcium and magnesium are pretty essential too. They're secondary nutrients with sulfur. And they typically are needed about 10, at one tenth of the, of the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you need, a, if you need 100 pounds of nitrogen, you need, typically need seven, uh, 10 pounds of sulfur. The same is probably true for calcium and magnesium. So again, that's why they're the secondary elements. And then you have the, the, uh, the iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc, and molybdenum that are needed in basically micronutrient, uh, very, very small quantities comparatively, typically pounds per acre. In boron, you don't want to be above four pounds per acre. So again, it's uh, these micronutrients then, uh, if any one of them becomes deficient, and they're more likely to be deficient when we get, uh, especially with the iron, the, the metals, iron, manganese, copper, and zinc, once we get above seven, we'll start to see deficiencies in, if we get our pH too high. Or if we get our pH too low, we'll start to see these deficiencies, things, especially in things like molybdenum if you grow alfalfa. Real good reason why you keep your pH up at around seven because molybdenum becomes very inactive quick. And also molybdenum is very important in uh, rhizobium development, so our nitrogen fixation. So again, all this kind of uh, lime has a lot to do with these effects. And so it's very important to maintain that, maintain that pH. Um, and so, and that's a very easy, easy way to remedy a lot of problems. Here's a picture of a field in Anne Arundel County where you can see these kind of areas of, um, of strip crops that they actually were, the areas where the wheat is doing poorly was previously in hay and where the wheat is doing fairly good was in corn and soybeans. And so the hay strips where the wheat, as they come across the field there, uh, were previously in hay, uh, the wheat's not growing. And you can see it from this way. You can see the wheat, even the wheat in the um, soybean grounds, not great. Uh, and the farmer came to me after they kept putting nitrogen on. They said, you know what? He said, I'm keep putting nitrogen on this field and nothing's happening. And I said, well, it's probably not a nitrogen deficiency. Let's, let's try to figure out what it is. And so what do you think? What do you think it is? So here's kind of a picture of the wheat. You come right up to the edge of the hay field and all of a sudden the wheat vanishes. And you look a little bit out in that field, you see the difference in looking at top of the wheat growth. And then you look at the soil test. And the first thing I noticed right away is on the side where the corn and soybean were, the pH is 5.6. On the side where the uh, hay field was, the pH is 5.1. The quickest way to reduce calcium and magnesium from the soil is remove hay. And so again, every time you, with the corn and soybeans, you're putting a lot of that residue back. You're only removing the grain. And so calcium and magnesium always come off more in a leafy tissue than they do a grain. And so it's that pH is the problem. And it really, it's, it's actually phosphorus deficiency. And so the pH has gotten so low 
that even though there's enough phosphorus there, it's deficient. And so it has nothing to do with nitrogen. It's a phosphorus deficiency is what's causing that problem. Once we get a pH down that low, phosphorus becomes unavailable. And so again, it was uh, kind of interesting, right? And phosphorus is critical for root development. Without root development, you don't get plant development. So again, it's, uh, it's always fun to kind of do a little detective work and kind of solve the problem, right? Here's a, we have 16 essential plant nutrients, right? Three of them were given, carbon from the CO2, the atmosphere, hydrogen, and oxygen from water. So a plant can enable hydrolysis and split the water up molecule, get hydrogen, oxygen. And of course, oxygen can come in through the stomata too. And, uh, and of course, hydrogen can come off the hydrocarbons uh, from photosynthesis. So again, the, these are given to us. And then we have the primary nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And we're typically thinking around 100 pounds for most crops uh, of each, close to each. Phosphorus a little less typically than, than nitrogen, potassium. Uh, and then the secondary nutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, about 10% of the primary nutrients typically. And then the micronutrients, much less, pounds per acre. A couple of pounds are typically sufficient for most of these in the micronutrients. And the iron, manganese, boron, molybdenum, copper, zinc, chlorine. And uh, so again, 13 essential plant, or 16 essential plant nutrients that come from the soil, 13 mineral. And uh, here's really interesting is you, you, everyone has to probably have to do this. They have to hold up your hand. So you hold up your hand, um, you got your five fingers, right? So you got your five fingers. So hold your hand up. And uh, what you need to remember is if you think about a fertilizer bag, so you got a fertilizer bag, NPK, and all you have to do is remember magnesium and sulfur. And actually sulfur is the fourth number. So if you remember the first four numbers, um, NPK sulfur, uh, that's typically how you'll see them written on, on fertilizer. NPK sulfur, and then remember magnesium, then those are mobile in the plant. And so what that means is the plant has the ability to move that, let's say the, um, the nutrients out here in an older leaf on corn, it can actually take that nitrogen, or in this case, any one of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, or sulfur, and can move it to the new tissue. So the old symptoms of uh, deficiency will always show up on the old leaves. So kind of think about that. Um, your corn leaves might look pretty good in the in the center of the world, but yet you're seeing them yellow down on the uh, on the bottom. Typically, kind of looks like that would typically be a nitrogen deficiency, especially if it V's down through on corn. So we can tend to understand that, hey, you know, we can see these older leaves, and if they start to show deficiency symptoms before the younger leaves, it's going to be one of these nutrients: NPK, magnesium, or sulfur. And then the rest of them, you don't have to memorize the rest of them. The other eight. Um, calcium, boron, copper, iron, manganese, zinc, and molybdenum, they're all immobile. And so once the roots can no longer pick up any more of these nutrients, they've exhausted what they can get at the roots, they can't take the nutrients from the older leaf and move it to the younger leaf. So the younger leaves are the ones that are going to show deficiency. So manganese deficiency will always show up on the young leaves. So will iron deficiency, zinc deficiency. And so again, knowing that makes it pretty easy for us to at least know what is likely to be deficient. And what's really important is the macronutrients and, and primary nutrients are typically mobile. And that's kind of helps us kind of really think about, hey, we see deficiency in those older leaves. It's one of those five really important nutrients that we need at a great level. And if we see deficiency in younger leaves, we typically can correct those if we see them soon enough. I've seen manganese deficiency in soybeans where we just go over top with manganese sulfate, five pounds of the acre and straighten that problem right out. Right. So again, really kind of, we can be really proactive when we start to see these deficiencies. Well, you have to remember that NPK, sulfur, magnesium, older leaves, you'll see the deficiency. The rest of them will always show up on the newer leaves. I think that's kind of a neat way, kind of a neat way of helping. Now, sulfur is not as mobile as nitrogen. I'll give it that. And sometimes the whole plant looks pale, uh, but the newer leaves will always look a little better. And just keep that in mind. Sulfur is a little bit harder uh, to do. You know, when we think about soil testing and 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 by especially purchasing fertilizer, there's a lot a lot of thought about the idea of build and maintain philosophy, right? We build our soil levels up to a certain point. It's kind of like putting money in the bank, right? And then you get a year like this where fertilizer, a couple of years where fertilizer prices are outrageous, and you start to think, man, I'd really like to cut that bill down. 
what what is my maintenance limit? What is the critical level that I need to put out? And so it kind of, we start to think a little bit differently about fertilization, especially when the fertilizer prices are so high that we're thinking, hey, I'm not going to make money on this crop if I put that much fertilizer out. I remember back in the 80s, my boss came to me and said, he said, you know, he said, we can't afford that fertilizer you're putting out there. And we, at that point in about, I think it was about mid 80s, uh, phosphorus tripled in one year. And we always thought it, we always put it on as luxury. I mean, we never really give it much thought. Potassium doubled, nitrogen doubled, uh, maybe tripled. I mean, the price of fertilizer went through the roof. And uh, and my boss said, hey, you, you can't spend that kind of money. <laughs> you you got to stop. <laughs> you, you know, you, you just can't, we can't afford it. <laughs> and, and he was right. You started pencil out, we couldn't afford it. And so that's when I started to value every pound of manure and started to think about, okay, um, you know, what is the value of that manure? And it used to be, we put manure on, we kind of put it on, it was like icing on the cake. We put all the fertilizer too, but we still put our manure on. And it's like, hold it, hold it. How much can I reduce my fertilizer application if I, if it's one of those five, 20% uh, of the fields that get manure that year. And uh, I pretty much cut my salary uh, in fertilizer bill, the bill that first year. And the boss was pretty proud and I didn't see it yield, right? So it's this idea of, what is that critical amount that we can go? What is the maintenance that's required where we don't want to see a decrease in soil test levels? But what is the critical level that we can can put down um, to basically keep keep us uh, from not losing money, right? And so again, that's I think that has a lot to there's this sufficiency approach, and there's a lot of different philosophies that come into play here. The amount of fertilizer, the soil test concentration. Uh, you know, are we going to build the soil test level up to a certain critical level, you know, kind of the build up rate. And, and so there's pretty interesting um, thoughts right now around, you know, uh, when fertilizer prices are high, it would be a good idea to maybe bank on some of that investment that you've made and make sure you put at least a sufficiency amount out there. What is that sufficiency rate might be a, more, a better term, a better approach. Am I putting a sufficient quantity out there for the yield that I anticipate based on the likelihood of, of seeing a, a basically a fertilizer impact to yield, right? So sufficiency might be better than build up rate. And so that's what we typically see when we think about soil night nutrient recommendations. You know, we do a soil test, we get an FIV value. And if we're up here in that, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90% FIV value, there really is sufficiency rate might be, you might not even have to put it much on, right? The idea is that, hey, you know, you got enough in that, you got enough reserve there. Now, if you're on that curve there around 20, 30, then that sufficiency rate might be, you know, uh, have, might impact yield if you don't put that fertilizer. Right? So again, pay attention to where your numbers are on that FIV. Think about what would be sufficient, um, what would, could be sufficient uh, if it would become available for the crop that year, and then fertilize to that, uh, especially when the prices are too high. Uh, so again, start to be thinking about that. Soil nutrient recommendations, typically we kind of class them in this low, medium, optimum, excessive. If you're in that optimum range, uh, especially high into the optimum range, you probably don't need any additional fertilizer. I proved that last year to myself. Uh, um, I decided to just put nitrogen on the field because it tested in that well up in that optimum range for both potassium and magne uh, potassium and phosphorus. I, I certainly didn't see a yield drag on those pumpkins or Indian corn or popcorn or anything. So again, uh, when we have those high soil test that is money in the bank and they're probably not going to drop it that dramatically um, by sacrificing some of that expensive fertilizer especially not going to especially going to be thankful on that wallet and it might keep a little bit of that nutrient from going into the bay too right nutrient management has allowed us i think to step back and and at least know um, our soils right and our nutrient levels and our fertility and i think that's very important a lot of times in the past we didn't have that understanding. We knew what we needed, but we just kept putting it on there because we didn't want to come short, right? But now we can really know and have a really good confidence. No-till revolution came along, and I was a big part of that at the Naval Academy Dairy Farm. I loved every minute of it. And we lived and breathed no-till. We go went to every no-till convention and meeting, and it was really fantastic. I can remember you go down to Salisbury Convention Center, there'd be 500 people down there and all kinds of no-till equipment. It was really incredible. Do the same thing up in Hagerstown. Just a different world uh, uh, going out to all these events. And it, it was farming ugly and all kinds of things and, uh, you know, all kinds of scoffers. But boy, the ones that were into it really, uh, really stuck with it. And it really was a revolution. Um, 
And we know that um, by reducing tillage, we can build soil organic matter. Uh, we can increase the, uh, the biological activity. We can uh, uh, have better aggregate stability, less compaction. So again, the benefits of soil organic matter and anything we can do to add organic matter to the soil and reduce tillage uh, was uh, certainly an important activity in agriculture. It will be even more so important as we go forward. I've gone around the world in different places and taught no-till, and uh, it's no less important anywhere I go, uh, all having the same problem. We've lost too much organic matter of our soil. Uh, we're seeing yield declines. We're, you know, we get in compaction issues. Our biological activity is just not what it used to be. You can easily see that when you go out of an area that's been plowed and tilled extensively, and go to an area that has it and compare the soil. So this no-till revolution, it came out, um, the first no-tiller was 1961. So I wrote this little chronology just to kind of keep in remembrance what was happening during those years, even before my time. 1961, the year I was born, Mr. Harry Young in Herndon, Kentucky, became Mr. No-Till. And he started no-till, and a lot of people were naysayers. He only had, uh, I think he had Atrex, Princep, and... Um, linear on he had a couple chemicals 2,4-D that was it he only had a few chemicals for corn and he was going to no-till corn and he worked with the University of Kentucky and they did it they they started no-tilling corn Henry Faulkner a little bit earlier he was a county extension agent he wrote Plowman's Pot Folly that's a copy of my book right there in that picture and I took a picture of it and uh and that's a great book because even before think about 1943 the first herbicide to hit the market was in 1945 by Gillette Platt Chemical Company, it was 2,4-D. And um, Edward, he lived through an era, he saw the Dust Bowl, and he knew that they had to come up with a different way of farming, that they had exhausted, in short order, the, the whole fragile prairie system, especially this short grass prairie system out in Nebraska and Kansas, and, and even the tall grass prairie was witnessing rapid loss of soil. Uh, all the major river um, uh, riverways now had to be dredged in order to get barges down because of all the soil clogging up everything and all that tillage. And they knew that they had to come up with better conservation methods and better ways of farming. And so Edward wrote a book on Plowman's Folly, essentially said, throw away the plow and just go shallow tillage. Of course, he had to do tillage to control weeds. So his, his tillage implement was the disc, and it gave rise to the reduced tillage error through his book and understanding of, of what could be done with shallow tillage. And of course, Edwin, uh, Hugh Edward Bennett, Hammond Bennett was the father of Soil Conservation District, and he's considered the father of soil conservation, standing up the USDA Soil Conservation Service in 1935. So all these fellows, you know, lived through that Dust Bowl and knew that something better had to be done. Well, in the 50s and the 60s, we did, the plow did lose ground to harrows and chisel plows, all kinds of different types of implements to reduce the depth of tillage, thereby reducing a lot of the erosion issues. Yeah, but they still didn't have the chemicals that come along until about the mid 60s. And so we can kind of see the early chemical plow development there. 2,4-D coming onto the marketplace, 54 paraquat, although it wasn't introduced in the U.S. until 1962 by the Chevron Corporation. Geige Corporation gave us Atrex and Princep. 1969, we got Lasso from Monsanto. And it wasn't until 74 that we got 2,4-D. So we were using paraquat. Atrex, Princep, and uh, and Lasso, and getting really good corn no-till production by the end of the 60s. And uh, and it, what we still were having trouble because we didn't have the equipment technology until right then. There's a picture of the Navy dairy farm in 1995 when I was farming. I like this picture because it's infrared in the spring of the year. And you can see that um, the everything that shows up red or pink has green vegetation. So again, there's very little areas where we had and this, by this time, we were 100% no-till for 10 years. And so typically, we had uh, at least a pinkish shade, which meant we had cover crops on everything on that farm at that point coming out of the spring. And uh, so again, so we had cover crops. By the time we got to 1989, everything, 87, 101, we were cover cropping everything and grew our own uh, cover crop rye. And, uh, and basically, everything got a cover crop. It's really important for a dairy because you're taking off silages and haylages and you're not leaving much residue. And so we knew we, the only way we were going to get organic matter is have a crop growing all the time. Then the no-till planter arrived. This was the Alice Chalmers, 1966. I remember we had one and it came in 1968. I started in 1980, spring of 1980. So my predecessors, Mr. Tidings, bought the first no-till planter in 
and a lot of a lot of no-till planters were purchased by Maryland farmers and this time at this time in 1968. And they purchased these Alice Chalmers. We had a six row. I even used that. Uh, I kind of wished I would have picked it up when they had the sale. Uh, I often wonder where it went to. I hope it didn't go to a scrapyard somewhere, but it's a beautiful old six row Alice Chalmer that I even still used and uh, still was a really good, amazing no-till planter. Very simple, double disc openers, uh, good wavy calters, and did a really nice job of putting that seed, uh, singulating that seed and getting a nice stand of corn. It was uh, it, a member of the crops master. I was the last crops master at the Naval Academy Dairy. Uh, Orville would have been my predecessor. Mr. George would have been his. Mr. George had to retire because he couldn't no-till. <laughs> he just couldn't do it. So they had to retire. Mr. George Orville came along, became crops master. And of course, I trained under him, become crops master. But through the 70s, you know, we added more chemicals and we added better equipment. Through the 80s, it finally got kind of better and better until we finally perfected about the end of the 80s when we finally got the no-till drill that could do it. That was that 750 no-till drawn jill drill with the with the Kinsey Brother pack of wheels. We finally got the equipment and then we got road cleaners that really worked. It wasn't until we got the Yetters that I finally figured we finally had something that worked, the Yetter road cleaner. And so again, I think about this, this idea of maybe with genetics, over the horizon, we'll have uh, perennial grains. Like, wouldn't that be nice to have a perennial corn or a perennial wheat? Uh, you know, kind of like alfalfa, where you just go out and harvest it. Then we wouldn't have to do all this planting and tillage. tillage. So maybe that's the future. We design our crops to be perennials, and then uh, we don't have to plant every year. Here, no-tilling corn in the 90s with, uh, again, those yetters doing some really nice. In fact, when you look at that field, that's actually about um, between 12 and 15% tillage. No-till is considered 25% tillage, but with those aggressive road cleaners, you're actually doing a, almost a vertical, uh, what we call a, a um, uh, zone tillage, right? And that yetter, that yetter drill, uh, was that's a perfection right there. That's what it took to perfect the road cleaners. Um, you've had to have a coulter incorporated with the, with the uh, road cleaner, so you basically divided that area that was being swept. And once that was incorporated by Yetter, they finally perfected it. We ended the wrapping problems. Also, they had no bearing hubs on the inside, so slick bearing surfaces on the bearings, so nothing could tangle. And they finally perfected, um, in, in this case, the, uh, the trash wheels, right? And then once we started getting into these no-till systems, um, you know, we started to build soil again. And so the idea is that we should always aim at full soil cover. I love that. Almost all advantages of no-till system come from the permanent cover of the soil and only a few from tilling the soil. So again, um, no-till is the soil, uh, this cover is the soil's first defense, right? And uh, cover crops are really important in nutrient cycling. And so we're really doing some amazing things with cover crops. Of course, it takes a lot of energy to make nitrogen. Um, we talked about that, the Haber process. And it, it, uh, it basically takes, it takes, um, N2, inert gas, takes a lot of heat and pressure, electric, and uh, to do that. So the, the formula there is N2 plus three H2, um, um, three hydrogens to make ammonium. And we do that with the, uh, on this hydrogen process with, uh, with, the, in the, uh, with energy and uh, natural gas is a big part of that, and electric to do that. So it takes a lot of energy to make that nitrate or ammonium um, molecule. And of course, we can also do it with these little fellows, right? Rhizobia, bacteria. And so again, that's that's a pretty easy way of doing it. Uh, and also growing a crop at the same time and supporting a lot of biological activity in the soil. So we need to incorporate more legumes um, and uh, as part of our, of course, soybeans are a legume and that helps. And uh, there are other organisms out there that do fix nitrogen. So we need to understand these systems a lot better too. And uh, that has a lot to do with just having good biological activity. Here's a picture of me in, um, in uh, 1991, uh, September 28th, 1991. I went out with the sprayer with some Roundup and sprayed the alfalfa. So about every five years, even though the alfalfa still looks pretty good, it's pretty played out. It's got a lot of inner crown space and it's, we let it grow for about four weeks um, there to admit that last cutting. And I just go ahead and spray it with, uh, with uh, alfalfa. This case it was glyphosate plus 2,4-D. And I came back that same afternoon. So that was in the morning. Come back in the afternoon and drilled it. There's that good drill. I can, it's capable of putting that seed right where you want it and putting barley in. And there it is. Uh, October went from September 28th to October 28th. The alfalfa is gone. The barley's up. There's no soil loss. No soil run down through that nice, beautiful pasture valley there. 
no gullies, no real erosion, nothing. Everything is completely intact, and we've killed the alfalfa. Normally, would have had a plow, disc, and disc, and disc, and disc, then disc and roll, disc and roll. Finally, put your barley in, right? Think about that. All that energy, and now you have the soil completely exposed to weathering. And not only that, most important thing is, is look at this barley in the spring following alfalfa. And I didn't put any nitrogen on in the fall. I didn't put any nitrogen on in the spring, nor at any time during the growth of this barley did I put nitrogen on. And here we are combining it. There's Orville in there, crop, crop master before me, still working. There I am doing research. And here's the barley coming after that alfalfa. And the amazing thing about that, that barley is when we weighed it, we got 119 bushel barley with zero nitrogen. Now, that's not true, is it? No, you don't get barley with zero nitrogen. You know you're going to have to have at least 120, probably 140, 150 pounds of nitrogen to get that kind of barley. You got 119 bushel barley. I put zero additional nitrogen on. All the nitrogen came from the alfalfa, which means we didn't lose it. We didn't lose it to the bay. We didn't lose it to deeper subsoils due down, down into. And so, again, uh, pretty amazing, you know, when you think about how powerful those legume systems are to get that kind of barley. Not only did we get 119 bushel, the best yields I got were closer to 124, 125 bushel, and we got 125 to 130 bales of straw. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing capture, probably about 160 pounds of nitrogen with that system that came out of that alfalfa field that we would have lost if we would plow most of it. We would have lost it to the atmosphere and uh, to denitrification and even lost down to the subsoil. So we got to think about uh, these soils. We got to think about all the inputs. Uh, we got to think about carbon and, and carbon sequestration. I think there's going to be a lot more done about this going into the future, trying to understand uh, uh, the idea of carbon inputs and the amount of kind of equations for carbon residues. So I think we're going to learn a lot more about the essential part of carbons in our in our soil and how we're going to sequester and manage soil carbon uh, ever gets more important around the world especially as we're going to, we're going to demand more uh, from all of our soils. We have 14 billion acres of soils right now in production in the world, 14 billion. And the, uh, we, we were, that's, that's roughly a little less than two acres for each of us. <laughs> and so I'm thinking that two acres should feed four people. You know, if we put the right, if we put the right uh, crops and, uh, and, and the intensified um, genetics and agriculture. So I'm thinking that, um, yeah, um, we're, we're, we're only about halfway there, what we, we should be getting out of these soils around the world. So we, if we think about all the production. So again, uh, without bringing any more land into production, we, don't, we should have any problems with science uh, increasing those yields and making it, us more profitable. Let's go ahead and put another course word there. And uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, oh, I don't know. Let's just, let's just make it... Um, how about carbon? Just we just can't forget about it. We'll make it soil carbon. Soil carbon, our 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 next word here. Let me write it in here. And our, we only got one more set to go. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, so soil carbon. A lot of times we think of it as organic matter, but I think we need to be thinking of it as soil carbon right now. I think we're going to learn a lot more about that. We talk about organic matter, but sometimes we forget. Um, really is all about carbon sequestration. Carbon is the, is the critical element of life, living organisms, at least the ones that live on this planet. Carbon is the basis of everything. Carbon chemistry is what we talk about when we talk about organic chemistry talk about inorganic chemistry that's every chemistry without carbon right and so again the two chemist branches of chemistry one of them is the bio the biochemical branch and i think that's where we really when we talk about agriculture that's really where we're at i did a little cool season study here at upper marlboro just about thought i'd share with you about this time of the year maybe somebody was putting forages out and uh Went to Pennington Seed and got some entries there. Um, Olympic, Olympic, Olympia Orchard Grass, Jessup, Tall Fescue, Arliza Timothy, Durana White Clover, Patriot White Clover. Went to King Agra Seed. They gave in some entries. Um, Persist Orchard Grass, Endurance Orchard Grass, Baroptima E34, Tall Fescue, which is also a 
um, like the Max Q or these novel endophyte tall fescues. Uh, mature prairie broomgrass, Balin, Kentucky bluegrass, and freedom red clover. And I put together a number of different mixtures here, with about 10 of them in all, uh, percentages of the different uh, mixtures of these seeds. Thought I'd just share it with you. Went out in an old area of the, of the research farm in Upper Marlboro, basically is in tall fescue and weeds, on a pretty steep hillside that I knew I didn't want to plow. But it also needed lime. We did some soil tests. The pH was kind of low. So we went ahead and limed it. I thought I'd give it a good year, a season then, to let that lime percolate in and to get it ready for a fall. So this is spring of the year. Hit it with Roundup. Put the lime on. Decided to put some millet on there. And put some millet on there, mainly so I could spray it with Lorsban, because Lor millet had a label for Lorsban, so I could kill the white grubs and wireworms. And you can see a few weeds still surviving, but the millet got planted. Um, and then, of course, after the millet, we harvest the millet. Actually, I actually put some goats out there, I think. We fenced it in and let some goats eat on it. And then we went ahead and hit it with Ignite, which Ignite is um, glyphosate, right? And I think of the, the three burn down chemicals. We got Paraquat, right? We got, which is Gramoxin. And we got the Ignite, which is glyphosate. And then we got glyphosate, which is Roundup, right? All th three of those are considered the burn down. So this is an application of Ignite. Uh, about 10 days before, well, 15 days before this picture was taken on September 4th. And so then it came back with a little cedar and put in our different uh, mixtures. And so we had a pretty clean slate to work with. And of course, we had the fertility and everything was addressed and the pH was addressed and we were pretty much ready to go. And there we are, September, what's that say? September the uh, 4th planting, uh, October the 5th, we Pretty quickly, we got within a month, we got uh, the stands were up, starting to look pretty good. There's October 5th, we can start to see the stands coming up. October 24th, they looked even better. So you can start to see they filled in pretty nicely, and you can see all the different uh, growth there, characteristics of the different crop mixtures. And then by November 12th, they still look pretty good after a first frost and uh, still look pretty good going into the winter. You can kind of see the prairie brown grass is kind of this light green out here and the rest of them, the orchard grasses, a little different greens in the fescues. And so again, uh, this is our first cutting, May 18th, uh, 2015. And this is some yields in 2000, um, let's see, that was 2015, uh, first cutting. So that's, that's actually the second cutting. Let's see, 2012. Okay, so that was three years, still doing pretty well after three cutting, three three successive years. And then here is our our, our second year uh, after planting uh, so after one full season and this is olympic orchard grass broctoma tall fescue and patriot white clover really nice high quality still quite high quality stand i think i think resetting by taking that old tall fescue out making sure it's surely dead putting that millet in there putting a little bit of lores band hitting it again with herbicides kind of really reset and addressing all the fertility really reset that hillside to really do some really nice things here's a bale in kentucky bluegrass Jessup tall fescue, Patriot white clover. You can see the white clover down in there. Here's a real nice Baroptima. Um, 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 no, this is um, Balin. Oh, this is uh, Timothy and um, uh, persist orchard grass and freedom red clover. So again, it's really neat to see the different mixtures. Here's that mature prairie brown grass, which only lasted. Um, I was surprised it only lasted one year after the initial planting, so it didn't stay around too long. Um, here is our um, Olympic orchard grass, Bartleza Timothy, Bale Kentucky Blue, Freedom Red Clover. So our four-way mix, very nice one, uh, very nice. Our only four-way mixture. And here's my lawn, a bluegrass tall fescue Ladina clover. Now again, I kind of like the clovers out there. Most people don't like that, but I'm telling you, if it's clover out there, you have a much better lawn. Every time you cut it, you fertilize it, so you never have to fertilize it along with clover in it. Anyway, nutrient management. We'll go ahead and wrap, roll through the nutrient management. We'll be done tonight few things to, to, to mention. The, uh, again, they, they want to designate the seasons now by dates. And so summer now is, uh, spring is March 1st to June 30th. Summer is July 1 through September 9th. Fall is September 10th through December 15th. And winter is December 16th through the last day of February. And so the, the, these will help you with your nutrient management plans by kind of understanding these seasons and when, when to apply. The um, Again, when we have the March 1st through June 30th, um, application time is spring. We, we got to be careful about saturated soils. You're not allowed to apply fertilizers to standing water. 
And so I want to keep that in mind or overly saturated. A lot of times, especially nitrogen, you'll lose that nitrogen if you're if it's if you put nitrogen on a water a water long soil, it'll get denitrification pretty quick, quickly. In the summer, um, summertime uh, period for crop production, again, uh, uh, probably probably some of your best times to put fertilizers on out there. Um, you know, uh, making sure that uh, you push your crop through the summer, good chance uh, uh, for that. Um, again, annual implementation reports. Always remember they come in on. March 1st, so hopefully everyone's got them in. And they can be completed online now. And if you do complete them online through this one-stop portal, you can um, basically get credit for a recertification attending like we're doing right now, a two-hour credit for doing them online. So that's another way to, to just do them online, your annual implementation port, and not have to <laughs> sit through two-hour training like we're doing right now. So might want to keep that in mind. The... Um, so again, that's that's all done on through the uh, Maryland portal. Um, some setbacks from nutrient application probably always should remember: no applications within ten feet of the water course, any open any open water, whether it's a pond or stream, and the thirty-five foot for broadcast, and then um, a ten feet restriction for anything that's basically in, put into the soil directly added to the soil, like through a plant or uh, side dresser or what have you. And uh, so again, these are kind of the setbacks. Uh, also, you need animal setbacks too. Um, the um, animal setbacks from the water edges is, is very important too. A lot of the conservation grants that come through cost share programs through NRCS and Soil Conservation District require that you have up-to-date nutrient management plan. You need to fill out this supplemental form that goes along with those. So make sure if you're applying for, an, and also call, uh, goes for the cover crop program now. You need to have updated nutrient management plan. You need to fill out this form for the cover crop program. So keep that in mind if you're in the cover crop program. Kind of new this year. There's all your different contacts from nutrient management office. Pay attention and don't let um, Palmer Amaranth sneak up on you. Just want to share some pictures with you here about that. Um, all you need is one of these plants to kind of get out, get started. And each one of these plants can produce a half million seeds. You only put 1.2 million seeds in a wheat field, so it doesn't take but a couple of these plants to put enough seed out there to cover the field like a wheat planting. So it happens pretty quick. Um, if the combine happens to do a good job of spreading it, a couple of years before you know it, you have an entire problem. So Palmer Amaranth, resistant to Roundup, resistant to ALS inhibitors, and um, also some of the new PPO products. So again, uh, we're running out of tools for this. Thank goodness we got dicamba-ready soybeans, or we'd probably be in big trouble here uh, with, this, with this weed. At Dicamba and 2,4-D. The um, uh, Palmer is um, is very smooth. Even red root pigweed is has more hair on the surface of the stems, and uh, and so again, uh, Palmer is pretty distinguishable that way. Very smooth, all, all, no hairs on any of the leaf or stems. Even smooth pigweed has much more hair uh, on it than a than a Palmer. Palmer also has a much longer um, leaf petiole. Um, the petiole actually will um, stretch over top of the leaf and be longer than the leaf. So that's a pretty good telltale sign. The female plant, uh, these wouldn't be considered thorns or spines or anything, but they're, they're kind of bristly and they're kind of prickly. So they, the female palmer plant, which is the one that produces seed, is also going to have these little bracts that are kind of prickly or stiff. And they'll certainly, the male plant will certainly feel softer. Uh, but it's not like the spiny amaranth, which really does have a thorn, right? That one really does get you. And sometimes we confuse, especially young plants, we confuse spiny amaranth with uh, palmer. So keep that in mind. They can look like they're both smooth or spiny has the spines. But when they're young, they look very similar. And so I have had people call me up to look at spiny amaranth or, um, and, uh, and, and think it's palmer. So palmer, very long seed heads. Hopefully you don't get to that point. Um, they're poinsettia, they're very smooth, longer uh, leaf stem, uh, the petiole is longer than the leaf blade itself, and then they have, typically sometimes they'll have watermarks. The poinsettia growth is kind of telltale, they kind of look like a little bit like a, uh, um, a kind of a, um, well, what's that, Chris, poinsettia Christmas flower. Also, keep in mind these ticks out here, you know, we, we, we're adding new ticks all the time, and um, here's kind of a, here's kind of a tick card here that has our major players. 
And the Lone Star Tick's the one that gives the meat allergy off a gal, which is terrible. Can't even imagine that. So, you know, pay attention. Uh, use some treated clothing. Uh, keep the edges cut down, especially along the woods a little bit, so you can kind of reduce the tick habitat. Um, there's a new tick in town now, though, called the Longhorn. This is one for your cattle guys going to want to watch out for. It's it's um, interesting tick. It's um, it was comes from Asia. It's called the bush tick or cattle tick. It does ca carry some um, cattle fevers, and uh, I don't think it carries anything that we have to be worried about as far as diseases. But uh, our cattle can be um, uh, they actually can be so numerous that cattle can become anemic. So one thing about this insect, if you do encounter them, you're not going to have one or two ticks. You're going to have a hundred of them. <laughs> it's going to be amazing uh, when you get into a nest of these. Uh, you're going to get swarmed essentially by these ticks. They're a soft body tick, the scutellum, which is that telltale area behind that behind the head, is very unpronounced and they are very soft. And then they throw the front legs out kind of like a longhorn cattle. So that's how they get the name. So that will be very telltale as you see those front legs come way out like horns and they're soft body and they're kind of just an undistinct brown color. And they also are congratory. So you, if you get one of these, you're typically not going to get one. You're going to find you have several, maybe even a hundred on an animal. So keep an eye out there on these ticks. They can actually become anemic and can have tick fever. And uh, we are uh, using tick control clothing, DEET, uh, permethrin treated clothing is probably a good way to go. Certainly wear boots and shoes and socks and all that kind of stuff and pants. And, <clears throat> and the lighter color clothing is better because you can actually see the ticks. And then uh, exclude the ticks by, by controlling the mice <clears throat> or even treating the mice. They actually have ways now of treating the mice with these little tick um, uh, tubes that have cotton with uh, permethrin in them so the mice can take it back and actually control the, the mice in their, their nest. It's probably good because we'll never kill all the mice, but maybe if we can treat them, reduce the spread of Lyme's disease. Almost all the seed ticks and deer ticks start on mice. And then the, 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 next, the next phase, they move into larger animals. <clears throat> Tick control, very important. Spotter and lanternfly. And where are we at with that one? Well, we've moved just about every county in the state now um, has spotted lanternfly. So, so we're all in the we're all in the quarantine now, except for just a few of us. <clears throat> and I don't think it's about time for me to stop talking. <clears throat> I've done about all I can do today. And um, anyway, we got one more last word. So, I th I guess we better go with um, uh, our newest thing here to worry about. That's the longhorn tick. So number four is long. Anyone seen it? Give me a check mark if you've seen it. It has shown up a few places in Maryland, so I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm kind of thankful I'm glad. I don't see anybody. Bruce, do you see it? Robert, do you see it? Long horn tick. Anyway, that's uh, one to worry about, I think. But anyway, that's it. That's our final course words. Let me write her down here for you. Long horn tick. Long horn tick. Do I spell it right? I think so. Let's hit enter here. Longhorn tick. There it is. That's our that's our four words of feeding the world, biotech, soil carbon, and longhorn tick. That's all you have to remember on that form. Get that form to me. I'll sign it, send it over to MDA, uh, and then give them a couple weeks and maybe um, they'll have you recertified. Any other questions? There's our form. Make sure you get your extension newsletters. Stay in contact, come on out, and uh, stop on by the urban farm. We're pretty busy out there having fun, so uh, we'll be out there tomorrow. <laughs> Actually, not tomorrow. Thursday, we'll be back out there. That's it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. Stop recording. There we go. We just stopped recording. <clears throat>